Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation to come speak at your event today. Uh, a few introductions. Uh, Netscope, first of all. We are a cloud security company, about 10 years. Our specialty is helping organizations protect data in SaaS applications. That's how we started. And then we moved on to essentially protecting data no matter where it might reside. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit today is how you can move that protection to wherever the users and the people are because in, you know, we've moved from a data center to many centers of data. A little bit about myself. I am, as you can say or see it there, it says field CTO. What does that mean? Uh, um, I think it's kind of the coolest job in the world. I don't build anything. I don't sell anything. I don't manage anybody who builds or sells anything. Is that from a movie? Sounds like it is. Uh, I just think of ideas, right? Ideas and influence are how I work, and I get to touch every area of the company from engineering, which is where my role lives, to marketing, to product, to analyst relations, because I used to be a Gartner analyst before I came to Netscope, and I just really enjoy that sort of work, and if you can ever find something like that, I would encourage you to do that, but they're kind of rare. Um, although it is a growing title in the tech field. So if you want to get into a vendor and do something like this, that's the title to ask for. Uh, I've been involved in security since uh, 1995 when I helped my company at the time, it was the power company in Columbus, Ohio, connect to the internet. They said, hey, we want to do this thing. And I said, all right, give me a firewall. And they're like, what do you need a firewall for? Well, what do we as a power company do? We generate electrons. No, no, we send bills to our rate payers. Electron generation is just like a side hobby, right? We have to send those bills because if they don't get the bills, we don't get their payments and we can't buy coal, sorry, yes, it was a coal company, <laughs> to generate electrons next month. And that mainframe that generates the bills will be sitting on the internet. So I'd like a firewall, please. Now you don't get to have one. So I had to simulate an attack against the mainframe to see what it would be like if they couldn't bill all the ratepayers, And then they said, here, have two firewalls. That was interesting. I had never really thought about security as a role. I just thought I'd do generic corporate networking. But security became a lot more interesting. But at the time, it was all in one data center, right? And, and as we've moved into the future from 1995, security looks very, very different than it did back then. And what I'd like to do today is give you some perspective on what it's looking like now and what it will look like in the future. So here's our menu. I want to go through a little bit of interesting data at first. Uh, I want to then um, introduce you to a new context called context is the new perimeter. I should say new topic. We'll look at ways you can defend data and people. And then I have some recommendations that are wrapped up into the dimensions of defenses. So first, let's look at the data. Probably no surprise to you that the cloud is growing. And uh, on average, there's been a 35% increase of cloud subscriptions in um, just the first half of this year. And you can see, based on the size of the company, what the typical numbers of applications are. But not just more cloud, there's more people and more stuff. So, you know, from one year to the next, or for the first five months of this year, I'm sorry, the population of the user community interacting with cloud applications increased from 65% to 79%. But that's maybe kind of boring. What's more interesting is what's happening inside that 79%. 22% of folks are using personal applications to store business data. That's kind of frightening when you think about it. But moreover, of those 79% of the people, 20% of them will start to use a per, uh, personal application to store company data within 30 days of their departure of the organization. When people turn in their notices, many of them will start saving company data to someplace else. Uh, this is and growing, too. It was 10% last year, it's 20% this year, it'll probably be 35% next year, the way this is going up. So what I'd like you to do is think about what the perimeter of your security is. Look back to 1995, if you were around then in building networks, what did it look like? It was that castle and moat model. Everything you wanted to protect was behind the moat. You had castles, 
and your firewall was the thing that surrounded it. That was fine when you had one data center. But now that there are many centers of data, how can you protect it? When the data is everywhere except in the corpnet, and when your people are everywhere except on the corpnet, what do you do? You start to look at context, how the data is being accessed, who is accessing it, and why. This is what becomes your perimeter. Now, it's often been fashionable to say that identity is a new perimeter. I think that's probably not capturing everything because identity is perhaps the first of equal signals or pieces of content. So it's not just who that person is, but what device are they on? When are they accessing something? Many people have patterns, and those patterns can help you determine what's normal. For example, most of the time when I'm not traveling, I'm working from home. My home is in Seattle. I have a gigabit fiber connection from CenturyLink. I have a public IP address, 63.224.142.59. Go ahead, have at it, <laughs> right? And when Netscope sees logins coming from that address at usually the same time about every day, maybe they don't need to prompt me to single sign on every single time. IT department at Netscope, please listen. They do, but maybe they don't need to, right? Because it's the same signal. However, when I come to Oregon and log on in the morning to check my mail, or if I'm in Jakarta where I'm checking my mail, maybe it's a good idea to prompt for a second or a third factor of authentication because the, 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 the when is different, but the location is different too. That's the, the where. Notice, though, that there are two things that constitute the where, not just the location of the person, but also the location of the data. You might be in an industry with some sort of regulation that says Oregon data cannot be accessed outside of Oregon. So even where the person uh, might be not in Oregon, say they've come up to Washington to hang out with me for a little while, but they want to get online and they can do most things, but if they want to interact with that sensitive data that's supposed to be accessed only in Oregon, then that's another signal that needs to be present, is the data location. And then why? I mean, maybe this is stretching the word, the meaning of the word why a little bit, but you got to keep that W consistently going, right? What I like to do here is think about what is the sensitivity level of the data. That is a really useful signal when you are thinking about context-based access control. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If Alice is on, you all know about Alice and Bob, if you've been in security industries long enough to hear these terms. So uh, when people tell security stories, there are always, well, usually, two actors. There's Alice and Bob, and they're always trying to exchange messages with each other. I don't know if they ever actually meet but they change, exchange messages. Uh, sometimes there's a Charlie and sometimes there's a Diane. There's an Eve. Eve is the uh, evil person. Uh, um, there's a Mallory who's a malicious person. Uh, th there's the whole alphabet uh, of this, but Alice and Bob are the ones you hear most often. But if Alice is uh, on a managed device, then the policy could say that she has full access to all data because it's a managed device. You've got some control over what happens on the device and some control over how it connects to the data. If Alice is on an unmanaged device, then we can look at other bits of context. And here's my example of the sensitivity level. If she wants to interact with data that is labeled public, fine, full access. If she wants to interact with data that is labeled, um, uh, let's say, sensitive, then she gets read-only access. If she wants to interact with data labeled confidential, then the policy says no access. In other words, to interact with confidential data, you have to have a managed device. This is where these signals, this context becomes really useful in allowing you to design adaptive policies that respond to what's happening in the environment. Um, more a bit on device context. Many times people think about using the MAC address as a way of knowing whether the device is trustworthy or not. Don't do that. MAC addresses are not actually real. They're manufactured and they can be, they, they can rotate, they can be fake. 
Uh, most times when I see systems anymore, people are using gen uh, randomly generated MAC addresses in order to try to conceal a little bit from attackers who may be thinking about, oh, that's got an Intel NIC, I can hack that using some program, right? Uh, so MAC addresses are not reliable indicators of a machine. What are reliable indicators? Is there an agent installed or not? Is there a certificate provision to the machine that we trust and is from our CA? Where is the network that that device is on? And how fresh is it? When is the last time it reached out for some updates? So you get a lot more ability to trust that device when you have a lot of signals you can wrap around it. Data is another interesting form of context. You want to discover all the locations where your sensitive data might happen to be. And then you want to classify its sensitivity, you know, with public, private, confidential, whatever you might want to call that. Um, many people have a DLP program. Many people don't have a data classification program. My position is that a DLP program is almost useless without a classification system. How do you know what to do with sensitive information if you don't know what your sensitive information is? So if th there's a few points I'd like you to be sure to walk away from when I'm done here today. And number one is if you don't have a data classification program in place, try to start one, maybe like this evening or tomorrow. I, that's going to be really important for you to get a lot of the rest of this to be meaningful. Map your classifications to the traditional information security triad of confidentiality, integrity, availability. Oh, wait, did I get that out of order? Not really. The received order is wrong. Confidentiality, integrity, availability should be availability, confidentiality, integrity. Why? This is kind of interesting. Um, when, when bad people first started thinking they could attack networks, and this is roughly back when I was getting involved in this stuff, uh, in the middle 90s, there was a Canadian kid, called himself Mafia Boy. He brought down ZDNet, Yahoo, eBay, some others I don't remember, um, not, not Microsoft, which is interesting, because many organizations had the wrong rules in their border router. They weren't blocking inbound traffic with the source IP address of their own network. Why would traffic be on the outside that claim to be on the inside. Why would you even let that in? Just drop it at the front door. These were attacks against availability. Why did people do this, like the Morris worm? Because they wanted to be able to get in chat rooms and brag to their friends about how great they were. And that's how Mafia Boy got discovered. Chat rooms are not confidential. So then how do we protect against that? B good rules on our router. Now the bad guys moved on to stealing information, or more accurately, eavesdropping on information. So how do we protect against that? We added confidentiality controls, encryption, basically. Now the attackers are looking to make a difference. They want to maliciously modify your data or your systems to benefit themselves or whatever entity might be paying for them. I'll give you an example. Stuxnet, we all know what that is software that was modified in such a way to cause a bunch of centrifuges to self-destruct. Software can destroy hardware. Don't let that old saying think, make you believe it still isn't true. It is true. And this is what I worry about. Now, how do we protect against malicious modification of data or software? Integrity controls like digital signatures are one way to do it. This is the hardest thing. If you're younger and are looking to make a difference in the information security world, start studying how to provide integrity protection for data and applications. You will come up with new things and you will be rich and famous. Well, famous maybe, I don't know about rich. But anyway, enough about ACI. Be sure to define the lifetimes of data. No data should persist forever. Every data object needs to have an expiration date that is enforced. And when it expires, you delete it, and then you do a secure delete across that to make sure it can't be recovered from the physical disk afterward. But most importantly, you need to identify owners. IT departments don't own the data. It's the business units who own the data. They have to work together with the IT department to figure out what all that context means and how it can be used in policies that help you inspect the data as it comes and goes across the environment, govern it to ensure that it's going to the right places and not to the wrong places, and then apply some controls around who can use that data when, why, for example, all the other context. I mentioned identity in the beginning as it being a port of uh, important element of context. Identities have life cycles too. 
provision, manage, govern, report and score, and retire, we often forget about retiring identities, much the same we forget about retiring that data. When a person is no longer at your organization, you need to disable their accounts immediately. Don't delete, because then you won't be able to look at historical activity, but disable them, and then make sure that that propagates through any other system that you might have. But more importantly than that one in, uh, event when someone leaves, always you want to be scoring how people are behaving. Scoring is a theme in the information I'm sharing you, with you here today. And we'll talk a little bit more about why scores matter. Scores give you an indication of how trustworthy or not particular behaviors are, which can be extrapolated into other groups uh, or groups that have um, people have with similar job roles in them. Now, why is it important to have an identity context? Because it's the best way that you can begin implementing breach avoidance programs, whether that's access management or credential management or, again, coming back to governance. You can't do any of this without identity. So yes, maybe identity is uh, one of many contextual elements. Perhaps it is the most important, uh, but it isn't certainly the only one because we've got that endpoint context too. I've talked about endpoints a little bit so far today. Uh, for managed devices, you know, it's the normal stuff. Identify it, isolate it if necessary, and start generating that score about what's happening on the device. Is it generally being used for expected actions, or is this device or this class of device starting to exhibit signs of abnormal behavior, whether it's because it's been abused or it's been attacked, or it's just the, the owner is in a different place and you need to double check on that to make sure that it's still okay. What about unmanaged devices? I gave you that example earlier of a context-based control on Alice with her unmanaged device. There it is. These are important things to begin developing, important practices to begin developing, because as security professionals, we don't want to be the ones who stand on the table in the room and shout, no, you're not allowed to do that. Those days are long gone. What we want to be able to do is most times say yes when someone asks for something with conditions. Conditions are the context. Applications have context too. And it's kind of like data. You want to make that inventory. You want to make sure that the inventory of your current applications somehow matches what you think your preferred inventory might be. Uh, most companies use probably 10 times the number of cloud subscriptions that they think they do. Uh, you want to map again back to the information security triad but not just mapping to the triad, you also need to do this really sophisticated thing of trying to figure out what applications talk to what other applications. And sometimes it doesn't always pass through your own environment. We are now beginning to see cloud applications interact amongst themselves without ever passing through a person's device. There's one cloud subscription being hooked to another. These are very, very difficult, I would almost say pernicious, in order to control, trying to figure out what's going on in that environment, that there are ways you can do that. Also, most organizations don't live in silos anymore. Silos, what, cylinders of excellence? Uh, um, they cooperate with other companies. There are people in other companies who may need to access data in your environment. How can you ensure that you are sharing only the right data with the right people at the right time for the right reasons? Again, there are ways to do this, but you have to consciously think about these sorts of things. And then finally, another example of scoring. Now, many, many scores come into these calculations. Lastly, we have network context. I've mentioned a couple of times now this idea of moving away from one data center to many centers of data. But it's still important to think about what am I going to do with users who are on my network accessing stuff on my network versus users who are off my network accessing stuff that might be elsewhere. In the off network scenario, my suggestion is you're going to be using proxies and agents. Proxies and agents are what allow you to move the security controls as close as possible to the people and the data instead of keeping it centralized. Now, when it's on the network, you're going to change the way you build your network. There will no longer be uh, this sort of implicit trust that goes on, no trust zones anymore. You want to have a default deny position even for everything in the local network. When you have context and you have trust scores, 
or tr context and scores, you can now build trust levels. And it's just a simple calculation. What is the score of the component? What is the context that we are interacting with? That gives us a score of the risk. How risky is this action? What controls should we put in place given the risk that we evaluated? That is what allows us to implement adaptive policies or build a trust level. Now, I'm trying to avoid saying the words zero trust. You know, I've been talking a little bit about trust. Um, and many times people try to invert, you know, zero trust. We go from trust but verify to verify then trust. And, uh, you know, let's think though about the traditional way of thinking. Trust and then verify what happens after you verify. What do you do in your environments right now to make sure that Alice is still Alice and behaves like Alice after she logs in? Probably not much. So I do like the idea of inverting it to verify and then trust to a certain degree, but there's this cycle that you must always go through. You can't trust once and then keep trusting forever. You must continuously assess the context, the signals, and change that level of trust. So instead of continuous adaptive trust, I like to talk, or zero trust, sorry. I like to talk about continuous adaptive trust, and it begins with that assessment phase, and then it still is the cycle, always assessing, always assessing. And if the conditions are improving, you can then grant more trust, and if the conditions are deteriorating, you can take away or you can reduce the amount of trust. You have less trust. Continuous adaptive trust is what allows you to create programs of adaptive access. Now, most of us are used to thinking in a binary way. You get all access or you get no access. But what about those scenarios where you need something in between? I hope this is now kind of a summary for you in your mind. We are taking signals from the environment, evaluating what they tell us, and then for each and every action in each and every application, we can apply the right policy right there. Permit, do we need to restrict? Do we need to redirect to someplace else? Do we need to coach this user before allowing them to do something? Or in now rare occasions, do we want to deny it? Now, so there's the setup. How can you defend things? Uh, well, you know, we have a couple simple goals here, right? We want to def neutralize threats. We want to keep the attackers away. We want to protect our data, make sure that it goes where it's supposed to go. But there's a third element here that um, I'm becoming increasingly more interested in, and it's this idea of demonstrating good governance. Every cloud using company, that would be every company, or every cloud using agency, that would be every agency, is under increased pressure from auditors and regulators and maybe even your own customers or citizens to demonstrate that you are governing your use of the cloud. And many of the tools that you can use today to generate these, uh, this world of adaptive access, continuous adaptive trust, give you the evidence that you can use to demonstrate you are governing your cloud and that you are reducing risk over time. This is the kinds of things that boards of directors really love to see is evidence that you are reducing risk. That's why I think governance is equally important as the first two. Now, I wanna talk about threats and defenses for the three most common forms of traffic that most companies and agencies have to interact with. The first is traffic to SaaS applications, somebody else's application that you subscribe to, like Office 365 or Google Workspace. The biggest threat I see with these is poor configurations. In SaaS applications, the vendors have decided that ease of use is more important than anything else. Now, we can argue over whether that's a, a good security default, but it is the default. And in many cases, the wide open sharing is risky. If you have access to a file in Office 365, you can create a sharing link to anybody on the planet and send it to them. And if you don't change Microsoft's defaults, then anybody, that, that recipient can access that file. Probably not 
maybe a very good default for most organizations, but it's what it's the way it is. Uh, um, and because SaaS applications uh, are default to ease of use, they are also easy to provision, and it's easy to overlook. In my time as a Gartner analyst, um, I studied public cloud security, wrote a lot about it, wrote a few magic quadrants and market guides. Uh, um, I noticed that SaaS applications were largely ignored by IT departments. I don't understand that because 70% of an enterprise's data is now stored in SaaS applications and most, most, uh, most commercial entities, probably not the same for agencies, spend about one and a half times as much of SaaS as they do infrastructure as a service. This stuff needs a lot of attention, but it escapes governance. Those days are hopefully coming to an end. Uh, and like I said, you know, there's just too much sharing. Now, one thing to realize, that sharing is often much more inadvertent than malicious. Uh, mentioned earlier, it does increase when a person plans to quit, but you do need to think about increasing the uh, safety of those defaults in your cloud subscriptions. Uh, uh, and SaaS is actually popular among attackers. We have a lot of other data at Netscope where we're seeing that the largest sources of attack are OneDrive and SharePoint and Google Drive, it's because they're often wide open and people are, attackers are able to steal credentials quite easily to cloud subscriptions these days. Uh, this is the great thing about single sign-on. It makes it easier for you. You don't have to log in once in the morning. It makes it easier for the attacker. They only need to attack one credential and then they can go everywhere. Um, I haven't made up my mind if I think single sign-on is actually a good idea still today, even though people usually think it is. Um, just keep that in mind. Now, how do you protect SaaS? I'm a big fan of these tools called SaaS Security Posture Management. Uh, they look at how you at all the SaaS applications you subscribe to. They compare it against baselines, and they give you recommendations on how you can get better than the default configurations. And they also help you define those policies for the unmanaged devices that we talked about before. I mentioned this idea of coaching. Coaching is a really useful technique for helping nudge folks in the right direction to be making the right decisions for security. Uh, cut down on that sharing, as I mentioned earlier, and then move beyond passwords. If you can get away from passwords and uh, some of these, like the YubiKeys, I, I, I like these things. Uh, I don't have one yet that I use in production. I've got one to kind of play around with, um, but I'm, I'm thinking this is really gonna be the way to go. Uh, uh, the FIDO Alliance for that. A little bit more on SaaS before we move on. Um, just because you subscribe to a provider who has multiple third-party attestations, it doesn't mean you're automatically compliant. You have to configure the application to be compliant with whatever regulatory regime you might be existing under. Also, think about how you're gonna persist if the SaaS application goes offline. There actually aren't a lot of options here. There are tools out there that will claim to back up your SaaS applications, but good luck taking that Salesforce data and using it in something other than Salesforce. I'm not sure that SaaS backup is uh, actually a useful thing to be thinking about. And I'm, I would worry a lot more about uh, my data center going offline than Salesforce these days. They're pretty good. Second thing, web. Uh, we all know about web attacks. We are all familiar with them. At RSA earlier this year, uh, I saw a new attack where somebody had embedded a local proxy on a machine. That was neat. When you get a local proxy on a machine, you can now act as the user directly and do anything the user is allowed to do. Hmm. Um, we all know about risky sites, um, and the thing that I want you to think about email is make sure you've got all forms of email authentication enabled on whatever email provider you use. That's um, SPF, uh, DKIM, DMARC. These are ways you ensure that the recipients of your email know that the email came from you and not someone trying to impersonate you. Um, we know how to protect web browsers. My big uh, favorite mechanism there is to perform isolation whenever someone wants to visit a risky site. Um, we also want to control which destinations people are going to. We want to look at the activities that people are performing on destinations that we don't know much about, and even maybe not only constrain uh, what they, where they go, but what they can do when they get there. You might have a business partner with some stuff in Dropbox. Your corporate policy says don't use Dropbox. Well, maybe you could grant some people read-only access to Dropbox so they can at least download what they need to get from the business partner. 
And then again, harden that email. Use all those forms of email authentication. Finally, private applications. These would be anything running in either your data center or in an IaaS cloud, like AWS or Azure. Uh, um, the paradigm typically has been connect, then authenticate. What if you connect and don't authenticate and just throw bad traffic at something to see if you can make it fall over? That's how most services are brought offline because they're built around this idea of implicit trust. Only trusted people will try to do something. Poor configuration is also a problem in IaaS, but not as big of a problem as it is with SaaS. So I'm a big fan of hiding your assets. Some people say obscurity is never a part of a security strategy. I think it is part of a strategy, not your entire strategy, but if the bad guys can't find something, they can't break it down. So authenticate, then connect. We're now moving from what's called implicit trust to explicit trust. This is, means only any interaction that you've previously approved can now happen. And it allows us to standardize on security policies. Okay, I've got two more slides because I just told too many stories here. Um, what is our normal method of interacting with resources? Alice connects to a place or to a, to a server and she can do something, but what if she didn't authenticate first? Uh, th this, is the end, th this is the end of that style. I want this to stop. I don't want it to be around anymore. Instead, I want you to think about some service in the cloud that has some attributes. They usually start with the word single, single platform, single engine, single pass single console and a single agent. And I want you to think about sending all your traffic to this service in the cloud. This service is a centralized policy decision point. It makes all the decisions about whether something should be allowed or not. And then after the decision is made, can that data be sent to wherever it should go or bad stuff blocked. This gives you a form of distributed policy enforcement. Now in reality, the distribution isn't just at the apps, it's also on the left-hand side. But this is the way you can move to an environment of where your security and your data, or your, your security is everywhere your data and applications are, which is everywhere. Thank you very much. Appreciate your indulgence for a couple of minutes over time. It's great to be here. Have a good day, everyone.